Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to today's webinar, Learn About Alternative Fuels and Clean Cities and Communities. And you are going to learn a lot. We're very glad you're here. First, a little housekeeping. We will be posting the recording and slides on our National RTAP website and our webinars page. While this is going on, you can enter questions in the Q&A box on Zoom, and after our panelist presentation, we'll address all your questions. If you are having trouble using Zoom, please chat with us, and we will address your issue. After the webinar, there will be a very brief post-webinar survey. Uh, we'll have a QR code if you want to scan that today, and if not, you'll receive an email tomorrow. So we'll also be giving you um, updates on additional webinars on workshops on this topic and many other topics at the end. So if um, you're unfamiliar with National RTAP, National Rural Transit Assistance Program, we are a technical assistance center funded by FTA through the Section 5311 Rural Transit Program. We provide free training materials and technical assistance to rural and tribal transit providers and to the state RTAPs. We're governed by a review board, 14 state DOT and rural and tribal transit agency staff and managers from across the country. You can learn more about us on our website, nationalrtap.org, and here's a screenshot of our website. Please visit. We offer many free resources and services, training manuals, videos, slides, e-learning, both for frontline staff and transit management, lots of information, technical briefs, toolkits, topic guides, articles, and more. We offer technology tools for procurement, cost allocation, building websites, and GTFS. Uh, peer networking webinars like this one, conferences, roundtables, and online forums, and of course, assistance through reference services and technical support. So bring us your questions, uh, questions during this webinar and any time thereafter. We're here for you. Uh, national RTAP is part of another library. It's also a national library, TACL, the Transportation Technical Assistance Coordination Library which as you can imagine by its name is all about transportation coordination. It um, is a library of FTA and all of its technical assistance centers. So um, that's the URL for TACL, transportation-tackle.org. So now it is my pleasure to introduce an extremely talented panel of presenters, all experts, on um, alternative fuels and many other topics. And you'll hear from all of them about their programs and um, certainly about alternative fuels. So today with us, we have Justin Breitharp, the Senior Program Manager for the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance, Kelsey Owley, the Community Engagement Liaison for the Land of Sky Clean Vehicles Coalition, Casey Foster, the Fleet Program Director for Alabama Clean Fuels Coalition, and Michelle Merchant, the Director of Tulsa Area Clean Cities. So I'm um, really excited to hear what everybody has to say. And you'll hear from all of them, including Justin right now. Thank you, Cara. Um, Good afternoon and morning, everyone. I'm Justin Breitbart with the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance. We're a regional energy efficiency organization based in Atlanta, Georgia, um, promoting energy efficiency as a catalyst for economic growth, workforce development, and energy security. And we do that through program management, stakeholder engagement, policy, and research. And we serve 11 southeastern states, as you see on this map, on this slide, as well as the state of Hawaii and the five U.S. island territories. Um, but we're excited to work with you all today. We are not a Clean Cities Coalition ourselves, but we do work closely as we can with all the coalitions in the states that we do serve. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to, I think Casey will talk about Clean Cities. Thank you, Justin. 
Thank you, Justin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Foster. I'm with the Alabama Clean Fuels Coalition. And the Alabama Clean Fuels Coalition is one of 75 coalitions in the United States that partners with the Department of Energy to advance clean transportation nationwide. The mission of the Clean Cities and Communities Coalitions is to advance the nation's environmental, energy security, and economic prosperity through collaboration with communities by building partnerships with public and private stakeholders that create equitable development uh, or deployment of transportation solutions for all. And I believe Michelle will talk about Michelle's next. Okay, thank you. thank you, Casey. Yeah, thanks, Casey and Cara. Um, so my name is Michelle Merchant, and I am the director of the Tulsa Area Clean Cities Coalition. Um, and so as was mentioned by Casey, there are over 75 clean cities and communities uh, coalitions around the country. Um, and there are even some coalitions that may not pop up on the map um, that are working to become fully designated by the Department of Energy um, that are referred to as apprentice coalitions. Um, so we, as Clean Cities Coalitions, kind of touch every part of the country, both rural, suburban, and urban. Um, and so if you want to find the Clean Cities Coalition that is nearest to you, um, go to cleancities.energy.gov forward slash coalitions and enter your zip code or your city and state. And it will show you where your closest coalition is and provide contact information for the staff in that coalition. Um, and if it doesn't look like your area is covered, so if you live in one of those areas in this map here on the left side of the screen that's in white, um, that's an area where, it, and for example, in uh, Mississippi, there's an apprentice coalition uh, that's being developed. And so if you just reach out to that nearest coalition to you, um, they can either help you out with whatever your question is, or they can connect you with an apprentice coalition potentially that might not be listed through this tool. So definitely encourage you all to utilize Clean Cities as a resource because we are here like RTAP to serve you all. Thank you, Michelle. And I hope all of our um, attendees check out um, the SEEA if you're in the Southeast and definitely the Clean Cities Coalition wherever you are. So now each of our panelists will talk about their respective Clean Cities and Communities Coalitions. So I'll come back on and uh, tell us about your own. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, Alabama Clean Fuels Coalition, uh, we serve as the principal coordinator and the point of contact for all clean fuels uh, information in the state. Uh, we were designated in uh, 2012 as a 5013C3. Uh, I'm sorry, we were incorporated in 2002 as a 501C3. We were designated in 2009 and then redesignated in 2014 and 2022. Thanks, Casey. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Al. I am with the Land of Sky Clean Vehicles Coalition. And this uh, coalition serves Western North Carolina and the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians Kuala Boundary. Uh, they work on the decarbonization of transportation and are fuel agnostic. They work with vehicle owners and fleet managers on making their next most efficient purchasing decision. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sure when we were designated. Oh, that's okay. Thank you, Kelsey. And for Tulsa Area Clean Cities, um, we were designated in 1997, and ever since we've been hosted at the Indian Nations Council of Governments and have maintained that designation with the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, although we're called Tulsa Area Clean Cities, we actually serve the entire eastern side of the state of Oklahoma. Um, and another Clean Cities Coalition based in Oklahoma City um, that goes by the name Central Oklahoma Clean Cities. Um, they cover the western side of the state. So between the, the two of us coalitions in Oklahoma, um, we do provide statewide coverage. Um, that's actually an example going back to the map that I was describing earlier. Um, currently, our map doesn't show that statewide coverage that we offer in Oklahoma. So we are also one of those examples of states where we actually offer even more coverage than you might see on the map. So just another reason to reach out to that coalition closest to you. 
Thanks so much, Michelle. Okay. So um, now that you know about um, all of our panelists and where they're from, we're going to start the section about the different types of alternative fuels. But before we get to that, we'll talk about a fuel that you know very well, diesel, gasoline. So um, you probably um, use it or have used it in the past. And it uses liquid fuel to propel the internal combustion engine of a vehicle. And diesel is produced from crude oil. So if you're talking about the pros, and we'll be talking about the same types of things for each of the alternatives, most transit agencies already have vehicles that run on this fuel type. Therefore, it's easy to access fueling stations, and most technicians know how to service buses that run on conventional fuel. But as we all know, just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean it's the best way. And the cons, and there are a lot of them, mainly that it generates emissions that um, have been shown by many, many scientific studies to produce harm to the environment, to uh, natural resources, to sustainability, and to the health of the public. So um, it's uh, something we, we do all know. Um, and then the costs. Uh, coach buses can cost around 500000 sometimes more, um, with maybe 40000 in fuel per bus per year. Uh, smaller buses and cutaways can range from 110000 to 240000 uh, for the buses, plus uh, between nine and $15,000 on average for fuel per bus per year. So I got this from one transit agency, your cost might be more or less, but this is just a benchmark. We'll talk about funding in some of the other slides, but there are no grants available to cover the cost of conventional fuel. If you wanna learn more about conventional fuel, some good uh, resources are the American Petroleum Institute and the Association of Diesel Specialists. All of these slides will have links if you wanna to go to the resources or anything else that's linked. But for a greener tomorrow, there is a better way. And now our expert panelists will talk about the different types of alternative fuels. So I will cycle off to the Q&A part. The first sustainable fuel alternative I will be discussing is biodiesel. Biodiesel is a domestically manufactured biodegradable renewable fuel that is generated from organic oils and fats. This can include um, used fryer oil from restaurants or as my tribal community uses our casino, which is a great resource and makes a fantastic way to repurpose waste products. Biodiesel boasts several advantages Firstly, it can be generated from a variety of renewable feedstocks, which makes it a versatile and sustainable energy source. This aligns with the Renewable Fuel Standard, a federal program that requires transportation fuel sold in the United States to contain a minimum volume of renewable fuels. Another significant benefit is that biodiesel um, breaks down naturally in the environment, so it's reducing the pollution and environmental impact compared to conventional diesel. However, biodiesel is not without its challenges. Um, one of the main drawbacks is the shorter shelf life compared to conventional diesel. Over time, biodiesel can degrade, which does limit its storage duration. Typically, biodiesel is blended with conventional diesel in ratios ranging from 5 to 50 percent. The uh, tribal community I work with, they have a school bus fleet and their blend is currently 20% biodiesel to 80% conventional. And while this reduces dependence on fossil fuels, it's important to note that these blends still produce tailpipe emissions, although they are generally lower than that of just conventional diesel. Additionally, biodiesel performance can be temperature sensitive. In colder climates, biodiesel can gel, which may require engine modifications or fuel additives to ensure reliable performance. Uh, when it comes to cost, biodiesel is generally more expensive than conventional diesel. This higher cost can be a barrier to widespread adoption, especially in industries where fuel costs are a significant portion of operating expenses. 
So unless your community uh, like mine is able to make their own biodiesel, then sometimes that can offset that cost. Uh, fortunately, there are funding opportunities available to help offset these costs. The Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Tax Credit provides incentives for installing fueling infrastructure for biodiesel and other alternative fuels. Additionally, the Low No Emission Transit Funding Program offers financial support for transit agencies to purchase low or no emission buses, which can include those powered by biodiesel. For more detailed information about biodiesel, the Alternative Fuels Data Center is an excellent source. It offers comprehensive data and analysis on alternative fuels, including biodiesel, to help individuals and organizations make informed decisions about their energy use. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next topic we'll be talking about are electric vehicles or EVs. These vehicles use batteries that are refueled using the same electricity that powers our homes and businesses, offering a cleaner, more efficient alternative to internal combustion engines. Electric vehicles have several notable advantages. Firstly, they are considered more energy efficient than their internal combustion counterparts. EVs lose very little energy to heat and friction, and they do not produce um, waste exhaust gases, so it makes them a clean, cleaner alternative for our environment. Electricity, the fuel for EVs, is inexpensive compared to traditional fuels. The maintenance needed of electric vehicles are significantly lower because they have fewer moving parts, do not require oil changes or other frequent services needed by combustion engines. Moreover, electricity is abundantly available. It can be generated cleanly on site using renewable sources such as solar or wind, further reducing the environmental impact and providing a sustainable energy solution. However, transitioning to electric vehicles has its challenges. One of the main obstacles is that the cost is of establishing large scale infrastructure charging stations, grid enhancements, those can all be really expensive and require a lot of work with your utility. So if this is something you're considering, which can be challenging in some locations, I really recommend working with your utility first. Additionally, the initial vehicle costs for electric vehicles, especially medium and heavy duty, like transit buses, the price can be a huge barrier because they can be significantly more expensive. Uh, some cost $750,000 or more, but the fuel cost for electric vehicles varies by location in your utility agreement. So that that is the one part that I think is really important is making sure you are looking at that utility agreement and seeing if that cost is going to be lower, which it normally is. Um, so our current school bus has worked with the utility and has developed a, or is in the process of building a microgrid with a solar canopy to further offset the cost for the use of the school buses within the fleet. Uh, the good thing is there are several funding opportunities to support the adoption of electric vehicles, federal vehicle tax credits and purchase or replacement programs such as the low no emission vehicle program and the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act, DARA, administered by the EPA, provide financial assistance for purchasing electric vehicles. Uh, there are additional infrastructure tax credits. Various They vary by state and location, so please make sure to look those up. And some additional resources for seeking that, or seeking that information, excuse me, is the Alternative Fuels Data Center, the EPA, and the Electrification Coalition are excellent. Uh, they offer detailed data, guidelines, and support for individuals and organizations looking to transition to electric vehicles. Thank you. Right. And um, I'm going to talk about ethanol. So um, ethanol, there are different blends. You have E10, E15, and E85. And E85 is the only one of those that qualifies as an alternative fuel. Um, you'll kind of hear flex fuel vehicles, um, which is what's used for E85 vehicles. And they have a gasoline blend with 51% to 83% um, ethanol. And it is a, a form of an alcohol. Um, one of the pros for ethanol is the job creation in rural areas. Um, there's a quite a bit of vehicle affordability and availability right now, as well as available fueling infrastructure. So 
Um, I know myself, I'm in Georgia, there are some pumps that still have it. Like you'll have the yellow pump that um, signifies it's ethanol. And then um, there are there is average um, greenhouse gas emission reduction by 40%, but with the use of ethanol. So it is kind of moving us forward to meeting those um, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Um, one of the cons is that uh, there's less energy per gallon than gasoline. So you won't get as much energy coming um, to utilize it. Um, and then just to give some example of the cost, um, actually using the um, alternative fuel data center that um, Kelsey mentioned, um, as of April of this year, the cost per gallon was 296 for ethanol. Um, so for funding, there are federal incentives available as well as infrastructure grants through the um, USDA's high higher blends infrastructure incentive program. And then um, some resources to look out for is the alternative fuel data center. You can go actually read about the fuel itself, an unbiased source. Um, there's a link to current, current um, flex fuel vehicle models. And then the alternative fuel data center has a law and incentive search. So there are some federal incentives as well as some states might go above and add their own incentives, which just might depend on where you are, and that'll be a good um, location for you to look at. And I will also add that um, if you look at the Clean Cities website, you can actually kind of look at the fuel composition of each coalition. And ethanol was um, a very huge part to the emission reductions for a lot of the Clean Cities coalitions across the country. Um, and, with, and if you go to the next slide, please. Um, then the next fuel I'm going to talk to you about is methanol, um, also known as wood alcohol. It was um, used in the 1990s, but um, it's now being researched more as a marine fuel. And that fuel is now included in the United States Maritime Decarbonization Action Plan um, as a way to reduce emissions from the maritime industry. Some of the um, pros of the fuel is there's lower production cost compared to other alternative fuels. Um, there's a lower risk of flammability compared to gasoline. And there's also the manufacturing from domestic sources such as biomass, natural gas, and coal. Uh, some of the cons is it's not as prevalent in road transportation now, um, which means just lack of infrastructure. And fueling stations can be expensive compared to liquefied natural gas, um, which is a fuel that's being looked at for marine applications. Um, some of the costs, it was kind of hard to find that, but um, I will definitely recommend reaching out to your Clean Cities Coalition. Um, they provide that unbiased um, resor resources and information on any um, alternative fuels um, that you're looking for. And then some for some of the funding that's out there. So as I mentioned, it's really focused on Marines, but the U.S. Department of Transportation's low or zero emission ferry program does provide funding for ferries that utilize methanol, as well as some states have programs that incentivize um, the use of alternative fuels that do include methanol as well. So do check with your, your respective states. And then if you do operate ferries, please look at that program as well. And then some resources, um, again, the Alternative Fuel Data Center um, with the methanol link there. Um, the Department of Energy's Marine Fuel Research, that's an opportunity to kind of learn more about the use of methanol in the, in the marine applications. And then um, the Alternative Fuel Data Center Law and Incentive Search, please utilize that as a resource to figure out what incentives are available so that you can take advantage um, to, of alternative fuels. Um, and with that, um, I thank you all. You go to the next slide. All right, so the next fuel we're going to talk about is hydrogen, uh, which is definitely an emerging transportation fuel, as we'll talk about. So hydrogen is a zero tailpipe emission alternative fuel that can be produced from a diverse set of energy resources, um, but is primarily created through the process of electrolysis, which will take whatever electricity you're using, whether it's renewable um, or if it is sourced from fossil fuel generation um, to create uh, hydrogen. So that's one way is through electrolysis or natural gas reformation, uh, obviously through traditional natural gas. Uh, some pros to hydrogen 
is that there are great benefits to local air quality, of course, because it is a zero tailpipe emission fuel. So as far as the vehicles operating area, um, they're not going to create any emissions through their use. So the same benefits there as your battery electric vehicles. Um, but unlike battery electric vehicles, the other advantages to hydrogen are the long range that are going to be more similar to your conventional fuels, um, as well as quick refueling, which is also very similar to conventional fuels. So you could fuel up a hydrogen truck, for example, um, or in this case, a hydrogen transit um, bus within you know, five to 10 minutes. So very, very much like conventional diesel or gas. Um, so it, they're also very high efficiency systems. Um, this is another similarity to battery electric vehicles. Both battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are very efficient in terms of taking the energy um, within the hydrogen fuel or within the electricity stored in the battery and transitioning that into motion at the wheels. Um, lots of efficiency there compared to conventional vehicles. Um, there's also um, abundant funding opportunities for hydrogen. Um, there's a lot of emphasis right now on zero emission fuels um, and their use in transit and other fleets um, coming from especially the federal government, but also in many states. There are lots of funding opportunities available right now for hydrogen. Some cons to hydrogen, um, as I mentioned, these are the early days of hydrogen being used as a transportation fuel in the United States. Um, so the market is really still developing in the vast majority of the country. Um, really right now, fuel cell electric vehicles are only available in California. And that's because California is the only state that has fueling infrastructure to actually get some hydrogen fuel into those vehicles. So um, unless you're in California, um, which some of you may be, um, it's still not quite there for us uh, in the rest of the country in terms of being able to procure these vehicles and have easy access to fueling. Um, also, since the market is developing, costs are still a significant barrier to hydrogen being used um, at a high level in transportation. So um, costs for the fuel itself are still quite high. Um, and as the market develops, um, we hope to see that lowering over time. Um, but also fueling systems and then the fuel cell vehicles themselves are quite expensive as well. Um, another con on hydrogen would be um, some safety considerations. So when Justin was mentioning uh, methanol has lower flammability than gasoline, hydrogen is kind of on the other side. So it has much higher flammability than the traditional fuels um, that we use in transportation. Um, there are some safety considerations there that are um, being addressed by lots of national technical groups looking at safety. Um, if, for example, in some states, I believe Rhode Island is one, um, there are some restrictions on being able to transport hydrogen uh, inside of tunnels, for example. Um, and so issues like that are, are being considered right now as we look towards utilizing hydrogen um, more widespread through the country in transportation. Um, so on costs of hydrogen, the vehicles are absolutely pricey, as I mentioned. So uh, from some examples in California where um, some of these buses have been deployed, um, we've seen that a 40-foot bus can cost over a million dollars currently, and is probably even closer to the $1.5 million range. Um, I'm taking that number from an article that was issued by Metro Magazine, um, and the quote there was that, um, a transit agency procured 108 40 foot low floor fuel cell buses um, and the contract price was set not to exceed 168.25 million dollars. So that gives you an idea of how much these projects are costing transit agencies at present. Um, but like I said, if you are in an area where you can procure these vehicles and you have fueling available, the funding is there. So really, when you're looking um, for funding opportunities, you will find them both at the local, um, state, and federal level, depending on where you live. But I highly recommend checking out FTA's Low and No Emission Grant Program, as well as the Buses and Bus Facilities Program. Um, you may also want to check out EPA's Clean Heavy Duty Vehicle Program, uh, which just had a round of funding, um, but opens up every once in a while. Um, and then you might also want to check out your state resources too.
Um, and getting into those resources a bit, I am going to also highlight here the AFBC. As you've heard many of our presenters today mentioning, this is really the go-to resource that the Department of Energy provides on all types of alternative fuels. So definitely check out the AFDC um, and look at their uh, information on the technology side of hydrogen. You can also find under the laws and incentives section um, some more information split by local and state and federal resources that might be helpful to you. Um, there's also a funding list that I was able to find provided by the Hydrogen Fuel Cell Partnership. So that's the second link there. And then I would also like to point you to a report issued by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and it's titled Fuel Cell Buses in U.S. Transit Fleets, um, and it discusses the current status of that technology as of 2020. Um, obviously, that was several years ago, but I think uh, much of that, much of those insights gleaned uh, would still be useful to many of you folks uh, today in considering this as a future fuel for your fleet. Uh, next slide, please. The next fuel I'm going to discuss is widely utilized here in Oklahoma, where Tulsa Area Clean Cities is, um, and that is natural gas, or in transportation, we often refer to it as CNG, which stands for compressed natural gas. So natural gas, um, which many of you are already familiar with, is an odorless gaseous mixture of hydrocarbons. It's predominantly made of methane. It accounts for about 30% of the total energy that's used in the United States. Um, in some states like Oklahoma, we're using upwards of 70% um, of our electricity is generated through natural gas. Um, so it just kind of depends on where you live. Um, it, as a fuel, it is lower emission compared to diesel and gasoline as well. Um, so that's the benefit of it. Some pros, um, obviously I just mentioned the air quality benefits. Um, in addition to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, natural gas offers some emissions reductions uh, on criteria pollutants or the types of pollutants that um, are listed by EPA as having harmful effects to human health. Um, so, for example, nitrogen oxide emissions can be reduced uh, upwards of 90% in some natural gas vehicles. Um, so there are significant benefits to local air quality if you transition from a conventional diesel or gasoline vehicle to natural gas. Um, fueling and range is another pro. Um, it's very similar to both hydrogen and your conventional fuels, um, where it's very quick refueling time, uh, the fueling infrastructure itself. Um, is more similar to the conventional fuel approach. Um, you can get slow fill fueling options for natural gas fleets um, that can be beneficial for some fleets in order to like fuel up overnight. Um, so that's also an option with natural gas. Um, another benefit is that CNG has been used for a long time as a transportation fuel and in transit operations. So you benefit from the technology having been relatively figured out compared to um, other types of fuels in a transit use case. So there are peers across the country that you can look to um, for advice uh, when it comes to deploying natural gas in your fleet. Some cons to natural gas. Um, so well, we've learned that some vehicle models uh, for certain applications, particularly school buses right now, so may not affect most of you, um, some of those vehicle models are becoming more scarce. Um, and I would say mostly just hypothesizing that this is possibly due to funding opportunities kind of pushing uh, towards other types of alternative fuels. Uh, funding opportunities are definitely dwindling when it comes to natural gas. Um, and I think that that has partially to do with the fact that there are more zero emission fuels available today than there were 10 years ago. And so now we're seeing, you know, federal incentives kind of push towards those even lower emission options. Um, but it does mean that there are fewer incentives for natural gas these days than there were several years ago. Another con to natural gas is that technician training can be hard to come by. So luckily in the Tulsa area, um, fleets around here benefit from uh, a really vast industry around natural gas. And so we have um, relatively better situations when it comes to trying to coordinate technician training. Um, but even still in a state like Oklahoma where natural gas is so abundant um, as a transportation fuel, uh, it can still be difficult to coordinate technician training. So that is a significant consideration for your fleet if you're considering transitioning to this fuel. 
As far as costs go, um, the costs are fairly competitive, but there still is an incremental cost um, to CNG vehicles compared to your conventional diesel vehicles. Um, typically, these buses are going to run 15 to 20 percent more expensive than a diesel. Um, so we're looking at, you know, maybe $540,000 to $580,000 for a 40-foot bus. Um, and that would be compared to an estimate of maybe $460,000 to $490,000 for a diesel uh, 40-foot bus. When it comes to funding for natural gas vehicles, I would again point you to the FTA Low and No Emissions Program, as well as FTA's Buses and Bus Facilities Programs. Um, I also encourage you to check out state programs uh, to see what's available there. Um, either your state energy office or your Department of Environmental Quality might have certain programs. A lot of them will be, a lot of programs will be through the uh, Diesel Emis Emissions Reduction Act funding that flows through states. Um, and some of it is also through the Volkswagen Mitigation Settlement Trust funding that also flows through states. Um, so I encourage you to check those opportunities out. And then some resources uh, for you guys to check out more about natural gas. Um, again, the AFDC, they've got a page on natural gas. Um, and then there's also the transportproject.org, um, which will have some information about conventional natural gas, which is sourced from um, fossil fuels, obviously, um, as well as renewable natural gas, which we are just about to hear about. Thanks. Uh, like Michelle was talking about with natural gas, renewable natural gas is very similar. Uh, as a matter of fact, you probably won't even realize that you're using it unless you're concerned about sustainability goals. Uh, because renewable natural gas goes into the pipeline uh, that natural gas is in. However, it is derived from uh, various different sources. Uh, the primary source is landfills. Uh, but also livestock waste, food product facilities, uh, and organic waste. Uh, some of the pros for natural gas is, or renewable natural gas, is that uh, you have fuel security. Uh, you also have the economic revenue that it can have, uh, the effect of in your area, local air quality, and then the greenhouse gas emissions. What renewable natural gas does is it captures the methane that would be emitted into the atmosphere and it turns it into a transportation fuel. Uh, so renewable natural gas is the only carbon negative alternative fuel that there is. Uh, <clears throat> like Michelle was saying earlier about uh, compressed natural gas fueling sites, they can be very expensive uh, and that there are also uh, a time fill option, uh, but the time fill option does take quite a bit of time. It's a situation where you're going to need to have your vehicle sitting overnight in order to uh, fuel that vehicle. Um, I talked earlier about sustainability goals. Uh, if you're purchasing renewable natural gas, you get what are called REN credits, which is a renewable identification number. Uh, you can then use those towards your sustainability goals. Uh, also, as Michelle was saying, your funding levels are not as high for natural gas. I've listed several different funding opportunities there. However, whenever you're looking at something such as the uh, bus and bus facility grant, uh, as an example, your funding level is going to be lower on a natural gas vehicle than it would be in a, as a percentage for say like an electric vehicle or a hydrogen vehicle, uh, even though they would all be covered. Uh, and then resources I have listed is the EPA and also the Alternative Fuels Data Center. For propane, uh, propane is a byproduct for producing natural gas and crude oil refining. Uh, propane is a, a fuel that's been used for a long time, similar to natural gas. It's applicable for light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles and has been for decades. Uh, fueling extra, the fueling infrastructure is very economical for propane, uh, and there's also an abundance of vehicle models that you can use, that you can procure either as original equipment from a manufacturer or aftermarket. Uh, some of the cons is that 
the capital expenditure can be a little bit higher uh, for propane than it is for a gasoline or diesel uh, counterpart. Uh, you're talking about a few thousand dollars in that case, uh, roughly about five to 10% higher. Um, also, your fuel economy is going to be lower uh, whenever you're using propane uh, than if you're using gasoline or diesel, similar to what Justin mentioned about ethanol. Um, as far as the cost, the cost of propane is very inexpensive uh, compared to other alternative fuels. Um, and so you also get a return on investment very quickly. Even though you have a lower fuel economy, it offsets that fuel economy by the price. Um, so propane is a great way to go uh, for light, medium, and heavy duty applications. Uh, again, I've listed a lot of the different funding opportunities that are here for you. Um, CMAC is one of them. Uh, the Clean School Bus Program, if that's applicable for you. Uh, but again, similar to natural gas and renewable natural gas, the amount of money that you'll receive through those funding opportunities is going to be a lower percentage of the vehicle costs than it is if you're doing something like a hydrogen or an electric vehicle. And as everyone has already mentioned, I would highly recommend anyone that's looking at an alternative fuel vehicle to reach out to their local clean cities and communities organization, as well as go to the alternative fuels data center. There's a wealth of knowledge there from information about the fuel, uh, as well as the laws and incentives that you can get federally and locally. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists for a very informative discussion. And now I would like to invite our panelists back to the webinar and we're going to begin the Q&A portion. While everybody is um, entering, um, you can use the Q&A part of this webinar to ask your question and somebody already did. And um, any of the panelists can uh, be the first one to answer it. Um, but we're going to, um, I will read the questions. And the first one we got, first it said, thanks for a fantastic presentation. How are the storage tanks holding hydrogen monitored for corrosion or cracks to prevent leakage, given that it has a higher percentage risk? Yeah, that is a great question. And thank you for asking it. Um, so I don't know exactly what systems are in place inside of these vehicles that are storing hydrogen on the vehicle. Um, that is a great question. And I think that that technology is probably still under development um, as these you know, vehicle models continue to grow across the country. Um, it is a considerable issue that needs to be addressed for sure, um, although not one that, you know, our technical folks across the country are unfamiliar with. Of course, we've been um, hardening storage tanks for other applications uh, for many different types of fuels, so uh, not an unfamiliar challenge, but certainly when we're looking at upwards of 10,000 PSI um, as the pressure that hydrogen is being stored at for use in transportation, it is a, it's a great question. Um, and I wish I had a better answer for you, but I would point you um, towards some federal resources on safety. Um, and I'll see if I can pull up a link to those and pop them in the chat for you. Thank you, Michelle. And um, National RTAP can uh, uh, work on some research for that. Okay, we got another question, actually two. Okay, so the first one was, in some states, they plan on restricting the use of natural gas for residential. Is that the case for vehicle fueling? So it doesn't say whether it's the CNG or RNG, but um, who would like to answer that? 
I can speak to this. Um, I am familiar with some states, you know, putting in place restrictions on household use of um, natural gas. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the inherent dangers that pumping um, a fossil fuel into your home brings. So I, I have alerts on like Google alerts for any news that pops up in the gaseous fuels realm. Um, and a lot of times what I'll see pop up on the natural gas and propane side are not transportation um, incidents, but household related incidents um, that are concerning safety, either to, uh, dealing with some sort of issue with the tank or leakage of the fuel, or um, in some rare cases, of, of course, there are even explosions of some of these tanks. Um, but uh, I don't believe that any of that is trickling into the transportation realm at this point. It's all um, looking at residential. So I don't see any movement um, that's similar impacting transportation. But as I mentioned um, during the presentation, we are seeing sort of a downturn in uh, funding availability for natural gas. So I think that maybe that is part of the transition sort of to other types of fuels from from conventional natural gas that we're seeing. Thanks, Michelle. And Casey, did you want to add anything? Yes. So I have not heard anything uh, regarding the restrictions. Uh, obviously, I don't know everything, but I haven't heard anything regarding restrictions on the use of it as a transportation fuel. Um, and like Michelle was saying, a lot of times you have a breakdown in different components uh, at a home where regular inspections are not being conducted, whereas whether it's a fueling station or a vehicle, you have regular uh, inspections that are being done to prevent those types of issues from happening. Okay. All right, our next question, and I'm um, not sure if you were able to, you know, find this. We found all the costs that we could at this time, um, but just maybe in general, what is the cost comparison of LNG versus hydrogen uh, for zero emission buses on a per mile basis? Um, sort of like um, what I did and I went out and asked one transit agency for, for what their costs were. But um, anyone wanna take a stab at that? Well, since those are the fuels I covered, I'll try again here. I don't have those costs per mile uh, basis off the top of my head. Um, really, fuel is all unique to your locality. So um, it's important to check with your local Queen Cities Coalition to see what these fuel prices are like in your specific area. Um, the cost of compressed natural gas here in Oklahoma is way lower than the cost of compressed natural gas up in Maine or in a different state where it's harder to find that fuel. So um, I would say also another thing you want to consider on a cost per mile basis would be obviously maintenance and any of those operating costs. And that's also going to be unique to the vehicles um, that you have in your fleet um, and other, other specific characteristics of your fleet. So it's a very good question, and I would encourage you to ask it to your local Queen Cities Coalition, and they'll probably request some more specific information for you to help you with that answer. Great. Um, okay. We got another question, and this is for all the Clean City um, alliances and coalitions. Um, and if Kelsey can come back on the panel, that would be great, too. Um, do any of your coalitions have testing opportunities for new technologies seeking experimental sites or cities or any kind of projects like that? Casey, do you want to talk first? Does yours? So I, I'm a little confused on the question. I'm assuming that this individual is looking for an opportunity to actually test some type of new technology uh, and is looking for a partnership. Um, if that is the case, uh, then I would encourage them to reach out to us or any other Clean Cities Coalition. Um, we don't typically have uh, individuals just lined up uh, for testing opportunities. 
Um, however, if there is a particular application, we can generally partner someone uh, that's looking at a, a different type of technology. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I just add in here um, that it almost sounds like you would be interested in some of um, the vehicle technologies office funding opportunities. Um, and I would encourage you to check out, um, if you go to, I guess it would be a Google search, I'll also try to find this link and pop it into the chat. It would be for um, the vehicle technologies office um, and just look up FOA, FOA, for that funding opportunity announcement. Um, and then typically those come out a couple of times a year. Occasionally they'll come out like once a year. Um, but just maybe sign up for updates about those funding opportunity announcements. Um, typically through those programs, they want Clean Cities Coalitions to partner um, with outside agencies to work on projects. Um, so if anything pops up that you would be interested in working on, then you can always reach out to a coalition near you to see if they would want to partner with you. Um, I would also say this is another reason to be in touch with your nearest coalition so that they can also keep you up to date on any uh, funding opportunities um, or other potential partnering opportunities that come across um, their desks uh, when it comes to deploying um, technologies like this. Thanks. And uh, Kelsey, um, if you're still with us, would you um, talk about what your coalition can do in terms of uh, testing? Um, I'm actually not familiar with, with what my coalition does. Uh, the work that I do is primarily targeted within my tribal community. Um, so I'm actually not 100% sure what the greater coalition does right now. Okay. Um, thanks. And um, I, I, yeah. you're not coalition, Justin, but um, does the SCEA help any... Um, areas in your range with if they want to test out different technologies? Yeah, I was going to add that we do have experience applying to um, the VTO office, Vehicle Technologies Office on grants. Um, and as Michelle and everybody has already said, you know, a Clean Cities Coalition, at least one needs to be a part of that um, project. But um, one of the things I will emphasize is that we don't have it. Um, we know somebody who does. So there are organizations who are out there who do kind of that more of that testing, the validation piece, and, um, and we can make and, and we can make those um, those connections. So um, and I, there was something else I was going to say, but yeah, I, echoing everything else that has um, already been said there. Great, thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. I see one. What would you all say are the biggest concerns about technology adoptions for communities in your representative areas? Okay, since we have five minutes, uh, this is, and uh, I do have a, a wrap up slide or two, uh, just uh, say maybe the top thing quickly. Uh, I'll go first. So I think this is something that uh, depends on specific areas. Uh, so I, I don't want anything that I'm going to say to be taken as a blanket statement. Um, certain areas are further along in electrification uh, and charging infrastructure through corridors than others are. Uh, other areas such as uh, Michelle in o Oklahoma, um, CNG is prevalent. I was just in Oklahoma last week and you can pull up to a gas station and get CNG. Uh, whereas in Alabama, that isn't as prevalent. And so there are, there's an app, it's alt fuels, uh, that I would recommend anyone that's looking at alternative fuels and you're looking for public access for charge or for fueling or charging, uh, that app, you can find that anywhere. But I would say that the, the biggest challenge is going to be um, infrastructure. Uh, and then I would say second is going to be cost barriers. Thanks. Um, who else would like to answer this question? 
I think that uh, Casey hit it on the head there. Um, I would definitely just echo everything he mentioned and then add in technician training um, because that's across all different fuel types. You know, obviously you need trained people to have confidence in adopting these new fuels. And it's pretty easy to find someone who can work on a diesel or gas vehicle, but it is harder to find someone who can work on some of these alternative fuels. So um, that is a significant barrier that we see to adoption of all types of alternative fuels. Um, one thing I would like to mention too is uh, for my community, it's a lot of community buy-in on if they are going to use these technologies and making sure that um, one of, you know, my role as a community engagement liaison is going out to the community members of the, of the tribe and asking these questions and making sure that this is how they want to move forward. So the biggest hindrance sometimes is just their general concern of like, is this going to work? Is this going to uh, continue to be sufficient for my needs, meeting my needs within my community, especially in rural areas where we do struggle with seeing these technologies catch up with urban areas. So um, the community buy-in is probably our biggest concern here. Thank you. And uh, Justin, do you want to say your, your top challenge? Uh, yeah, I, I will say the, the benefit with SIA is that we are regional. So every single thing that Michelle, Casey, and Kelsey have said is something that is, we echo that. One thing I will add, though, is um, the continuance down alternative fuels. We've seen folks will try the fuel and then they don't, they'll go back to buying um diesel or gasoline. And from our perspective, we do want to see that energy efficiency piece and the, and the betterment of air quality. So um, the challenge I think right now is trying to figure out how do we make sure that when fleets or individuals purchase these vehicles that they, they stick to it. And that's going to require a lot of research and validation and just conversations like this to figure that out. Great. Thanks to all our panelists and thanks to our audience for your excellent questions. When you take the survey, you can ask additional questions and we'll work to get you answers. So we're going to uh, just uh, one slide about other events you might be of interest in. Uh, we're having a book discussion group next year a training on our tackle library uh, next month, uh, next week for the book discussion group. And um, then uh, we have a transit manager peer roundtable that's focused on healthcare uh, upcoming. We have a mobility wallets webinar and a succession planning LinkedIn learn along. So um, you can uh, sign up for any of these on our peer roundtables or chats or webinars page. And we hope to see you at some of our upcoming events. And stay tuned for a um, 2025 National RTAP conference. So um, I'm gonna, I see a raised hand, but as some people have to leave, I'm just going to the last slide and then I'll call on you, Chris. Uh, this is um, our information, my information and the QR code you can scan now if you'd like to uh, give us your survey feedback while the webinar is fresh in your mind. We really do hope you fill it out and um, let us know um, how this webinar helped you and um, just general feedback on this webinar and future webinars. Now um, we have uh, still about a minute. So um, Chris, I saw your hand was raised. Uh, do you wanna ask your question quickly? You can. Put it in the chat or in the Q&A. We got a lot of thanks. Um, also, there's um, in, look in the chat for some links. I see there's some more from Michelle Funding Resources. And thank you, thank you. And that lets me segue into thanking our wonderful panel. Uh, thank you, Justin, for initiating this webinar, and thanks to you all for your expertise and a lot of research. And um, Chris, I, I still see you have your hand raised. Last call for your question. Uh, 
I unmuted you if you want to say something. Well, maybe not, but um, we are at time. So um, have a great day. Thanks to all and um, wishing everyone the best on their low emission transition. And please reach out to us or any of the organizations on today's webinar if you have additional questions. Bye.